first of all, we're going to look at learning outcome one, and that is all the experiments, and I call it the heart of science. In there, you would normally do some planning for your experiments. You would also uh, gather some data. We call it getting the evidence. And then you would deal with the evidence. You would change it, manipulate it, but more importantly, you would also evaluate the evidence. But we're not gonna focus on our planning today, neither on getting the evidence, neither on evaluating the evidence or data that we have. We are rather gonna look at how do we deal, how do we handle the evidence. Now, before I continue, it's important for you to know that the examiners at the end of this year, in both in papers one and two, uh, devote approximately 35% to 40% of the mark to practical work that can be tested on paper. In other words, they give us a number of prescribed, prescribed uh, experiments ideas that we should be testing in the classroom and then what we do is they test us on paper. Let's just see what the examination guideline of 2009 is saying all about this. I'm going back to my slides for a minute. That examination guideline, do you want to see at the bottom? It talks about learning outcome number 12.1, meaning grade 12.1, and it talks about experimental design, investigative questions, variables, hypotheses, and they say you must be able to identify dependent, independent, and controlled variables. They also say list appropriate apparatus and then plan a sequence of steps, etc., safety, etc., and suggest an appropriate method of recording of results. But more importantly, they speak about graphs, and they say you must draw accurate graphs from given information. You have to interpret given graph, and then you have to draw sketch graphs from given information, etc. So this will be our focus for today. It is important that you are able, as the slide just showed you, that you are not only able to draw accurate graphs from a given table or set of values, but that you are not also able to draw sketch graphs, for instance, velocity time graph, but that you're also able to interpret it, and that's where I want to focus this afternoon. So I would like you to have a pen and paper ready, and we're going to look at a few graphs, both in physics and in chemistry, and then we're gonna see what I think your approach should be when you are confronted with these graphs. Most of the time they're very easy and also you can score marks very, very quickly and high marks, by the way, if you follow our guidelines of this afternoon. First on, I want to go to a set, a graph that was given in last year's paper, in the physics paper one, and it was in the multiple choice questions. And this is what the graph looked like. The graph was a position, which is in meters, your position from the origin, versus time graph. And the question that the examiner wanted to know was, what is the maximum height after the second bounce? Now, what would you have answered? In other words, you had to give A, B, C, or D as an answer. The maximum height, in other words, the height after the second bounce. Come on, I see one visitor has logged in, two visitors. Please send me an answer and let me see what you do. In the meantime, I'll just bounce the ball a few times, and that gives me position A. And when it bounces, that gives me position B, and so forth. Do you think you know the answer? Okay, you can try and let us know. If not, let me go through it step by step and very slowly and then show you actually how we arrived at that graph because that graph has given many learners quite a headache. Let's go back to the slide and see how we developed that graph. 
after that initial bounce, this is normally the kind of graph that you would expect. So if I drop the ball once, it would be there. So this means this is a downward movement. If the ball reverbs, that would be position B. If it goes for its second bounce, that would be position C. And then up once again, after the second bounce, the maximum height would be position D. But the examiner never really gives us such an easy two marks in section A. For instance, if we have to draw the x-axis, the time axis there, then we would say that down is negative, negative becoming less, or if we take the tangent there, that is the gradient there, you would say the gradient is negative, and the ground is the zero position. In other words, our zero point is everywhere where the ball touches the ground. So the ground is zero position. You need to learn this term because the examiners these days would like to use and give you direct instruction where to put your time axis, if you will. If we now shift this axis slightly, let's say till there, is down still negative? Yes, down is still negative. You can see it if you put the gradient or a slope there, you'll see the slope fo focuses in a negative direction. If I, this is upwards, that is a positive direction for a slope or a gradient. That means down is still negative, but the point of releasing the ball is now the zero position. Can you see where zero is there? This is my y-axis, that's my x-axis, that's my zero. What, which point is that? Point of release. That's why I say point of release is a zero of position. But this time down is still negative. Now, what will the graph look if I make down positive? Ah, I think you've guessed it. Down positive, and I still keep that point of release, that's where the ball was released, as a zero position. Let's see. Yes, that is what the graph would look like. And that is the one that you saw earlier on when we were referring to the question that was asked last year. So this is now the downward position. That is bounce number one, bounce two, so D was the maximum height. That is correct. Now, some learners find that awkward position of the graph, but you've got to figure it out. Where's the starting point, the point of release? And ask yourself, is that the zero position? And can I determine whether up or down is negative or positive by using the gradient to the graph? If not, then ask your teachers to how to do it. I'll show it to you later in the program again on two other graphs exactly how we're going to do it. Now, in grade 9 and then in grade 11, you know, you had this kind of experiment where you set up and find out what is the resistance like in this circuit. Or you could find what the current is, if you will, by using an ammeter, remember, in series. And you would use a voltmeter and then take it, take the voltmeter in parallel over a resistor. Let's say that one there. And or over a resistor like this one here. Anyway, in the circuit for the matter, or even measuring the EMF of the battery when the circuit is open. So you can actually use it. And this is the kind of circuit. This is, by the way, is our, if I go back to it, this is our rheostat here, our variable resistor. So we can change it, make resistance greater or smaller. By the way, this is used for ohms to verify ohms law. But you will notice that what happens here in this circuit is that I can vary resistance but what am I actually trying to oppose is then to oppose the current. So I'm controlling the current, and the amateur here will show me exactly what the reading is. So I'm really varying the current. I'm controlling the current by shifting this lever up or down. So I'm controlling the current by means of the variable resistor or the rheostat, as we call it. Then what do I measure? I then take my voltmeter, and then I will measure what is resistance. So the resistance in the circuit, 
or any way is independent on the current that I control. So I control the current and then I take readings during the experiment. And that concept, my dear friends, is a very important one that during any experiment, I have normally have two variables. One of them, I randomly choose or I choose at will how big, how small I want to have it. And then I take a second reading, which is dependent on the first one, the independent variable. Now, how would one tabulate such a set of results? Let's go to my slides again. If I go there, I say, I've done experiments to verify Ohm's law or to find the resistance of a set of resistors that I have in series or in parallel, and the following results were obtained. This is what the results look like. I controlled the current, and that's what the current looks like there. And I read that off the ammeter, which was, by the way, in series. And I measured during the experiment the number of volts over the, or in the circuit, over the resistors. Then I did some calculations there. So that was the experiment. So the question is, what happens if I plot it, and what would such a graph look like? Let's go back to my screen now. Watch carefully, there's my table again. And here I plotted the coordinates. I plotted point number one, that means 0, 0,28. There we go. On my x-axis, and I wonder why I'm putting it there. And then 1,4 on my y-axis or my voltage axis, my potential difference axis. Question, why did I put the amperes here? or the current here and the voltage there on that axis, simply because this is the one that I manipulated during the experiment. And this one here was the point which I then eventually read during my experiment after I've controlled this. So I control this, I decide on this, I change this at will, and these are the measurements I get as a result. You get that? So this is called my independent variable, and that is called my dependent variable, simply because this depends on the set of results. But last year the examiner also asked another question. He asked learners to write down the coordinates of points that were plot on a graph. Let's quickly see how one would be writing such a coordinate. Let's take this one here. This point we know is 0, 0,28. This is 1,4, and I think I made a mistake here. Yeah, I've written 0, 0,24, but 0, 0,28 versus 1,4. That is the way I wrote the coordinates of this plotted point. So I take the x value first, semicolon, and then I take the y value and I put it in brackets. So that is one point. Can I quickly ask those who are watching, would you be able to write down the coordinates of these two points, either trying to read it directly from the graph or using the table? Would you be able to do so? I'll just give you one minute while I just shift this out of position. Let's see. Can anybody give me the coordinates of this point? But if I go down, it looks like 0, 0,45, five, five something. And I go that way, it's not quite 3. So what would that point be? Obvious, but I can see it there. It's 0, 0,5 and 2,8. That's right, 0, 0,5 and 2,8. Look at the way I write it. It's called the coordinates, the x, y coordinates. And that point there, something above 8, no? That's right. And that point across that way, something roughly just over 4. That's correct. They are read at 0, 0,84 and 4,2. Now, learners, ensure that you can write coordinates. I once the examiner done it once, 
they will keep on asking such questions. So ensure that you bring your mathematics into the science room that they exactly know how to do that. 